And this is going to be part two of your unit three review, civil liberties and civil rights. So right now um, I'm just going to pick up from where I left off because I had to go to CCR. But I started, um, well, I didn't start talking about, but we're going to talk about due process and the right to privacy really quickly. And this is like a an image that is relevant for the Griswold versus Connecticut decision where the uh, Justice Douglas um, talks about a penumbra of rights um, so just as a reminder on procedural versus substantive due process, um, the due process clause, no person shall be denied of life, liberty or property without due process of the law, um, talks about, you know, fair procedure, right to fair steps taken by the government before losing liberty. Uh, but then it also um, has been used um, uh, or substantive due process, which is this idea of fair and clear laws and fundamental rights has been used by a mechanism to um, um, incorporate um, some of the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights and some of the rights um, inferred or not enumerated in the Bill of Rights, but but seen as fundamental rights um, um, to um, apply to the states as well. So in Grizzle versus Connecticut, you can see the Supreme Court ruling clauses of the Constitution Amendments 1, 3, 4, and 9 um, constitute a zone of privacy. We had talked about this idea of a penumbra. So um, basically, Justice Griswold, or I'm sorry, not Justice Griswold, Justice Douglas in the Griswold versus Connecticut decision um, comes up with this idea that the First Amendment um, protection of free speech, the Fourth Amendment protection against unreasonable search and seizure, and the Ninth Amendment, uh, which states explicitly, and I'll show you right here, the enumeration of the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people suggests in his view that those rights kind of create a shadow and it, there's a penumbra of, of, of privacy rights um, and he infers from that this idea of a right to privacy. Um, also, the due process clause is relevant because this is a case involving a Connecticut law that bans uh, contraception and two people from Pam Clare and Hood convicted for giving advice to a married couple about means of preventing con conception. Um, and so um, essentially the um, right to privacy that um, the Griswold decision infers from the Constitution um, um, becomes instrumental in deeming that this Connecticut law banning contraception is unlawful. The holding is Connecticut law violates the due process clause of the 14th Amendment and zone of privacy established by the 1st, 3rd, 4th, and 9th Amendments. This case was the precedent for the Roe v. Wade decision that made abortions legal in the United States. We talked a lot about right to privacy in the intelligence score debate you saw about the NSA. There was a lot of talk about this right to privacy as well. So Roe v. Wade becomes uh, uses the judicial precedent set by Griswold versus Connecticut, and they rule that um, a law preventing someone from getting an abortion, um, is, a Texas law banning and criminalizing abortions is unconstitutional. Um, the holding does put some limits on the ability of women to get an abortion in uh, based on different trimesters. So the first trimester is women's rights overrode state interests in the first trimester, and the state can regulate abortions in the second trimester, and the state interest in protecting the fetus in the third trimester was more important unless the health of the mother was at risk. So you can recall the following about the 14th Amendment, the Due Process Clause and the 14th Amendment Clause, or um, the Equal Protection Clause. They're both instrumental in the 14th Amendment. We'll look at the 14th Amendment really quickly. So right here we can see no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. We talked about the due process clauses being important for incorporating the rights enumerated in the Bill of Rights and also um, uh, rights that aren't enumerated in the Bill of Rights but are inferred um, 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 
uh, incorporating them to apply to the states. And then now we're going to talk about the Equal Protection Clause in order to deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. The Equal Protection Clause enables the courts to ensure citizens classified in a suspect manner by states have equal protection of the laws. Um, so it requires and mandates there's certain types of tests. You can see the rational basis test, the intermediate scrutiny test, and the strict scrutiny test, which isn't relevant for our content, but you should just know that there has been historically different types of tests that are used for different classifications of, of people um, to evaluate whether government discrimination of people is actually um, lawful or constitutional. Here's the Warren Court, which is a very transformative court um, that really kind of expands civil liberties and civil rights. You can see the um, Warren Court kind of helped decide all these key cases in Griswold versus Connecticut, uh, Loving versus Virginia determines that states cannot pass anti uh, mis uh, mis uh, I don't know how to say that. Laws as it violates the Equal Protection Clause. Uh, Gideon versus Rain right determines that local courts cannot erode individual rights to legal protection. We talked about all these courts. The Warren Court really kind of, um, and, you know, is instrumental in all of these decisions. So the Equal Protection Clause, we're not going to go into details about the civil rights and civil liberties. So at this point in the video, you should just go ahead and consult your essay that you wrote about civil. I'm sorry, we're not going to go into detail about the civil rights movement, but you should just consult your essay about the civil rights movement. But I just wanted to bring up our attention to one Supreme Court case, um, Brown versus Board of Education, which overturns um, judicial precedent. Um, set in Plessy versus Ferguson, and which says that separate but equal doctrine that um, that um, the Supreme Court ruled was not violative of the Equal Protection Clause of the United States Constitution in Plessy versus Fer Ferguson was in fact violative of the Equal Protection Clause in Plessy versus Ferguson um, because equal separate but equal is inherently unequal. Um, the Justice Warren is noted for um, citing a lot of social scientists scientific evidence and considering the psychology segregation has on um, blacks and whites and claiming that it gives whites a sense of uh, superiority. Um, so Brown versus Board of Education overturns Plessy versus Ferguson and racial segregation. The Southern Manifesto um, is kind of like white backlash to the Brown versus Board of Education decision. We talked about Southern resistance and white resistance to the Brown v. Board of Education decision. At length. We also talked about letter from a Birmingham jail. I'm just going to skip through this really fast, but go to the civil rights um, essay video where you see me write the civil rights essay um, to get this um, detail, detailed analysis of this types of things. Um, but Martin Luther King in letter from a Birmingham jail, um, he talks about um, natural law and 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 um, he um, kind of is responding to a bunch of white clergymen that are upset uh, that claim that he's instigating in Birmingham, Alabama, um, and Dr. Martin Luther King espouses this idea behind why he thinks it's okay for him to obey um, laws. I mean, he was in prison at the time for um, protests or leading a demonstration without a permit. Um, and um, uh, he, he articulates this idea rooted in the natural law tradition that there are just laws and there are unjust laws. And in his view, just laws uplift human personality. Unjust laws don't uplift human personality. Notably, Martin Luther King says that the Brown v. Board of Education decision is an example of just law. And he is um, lamenting the failure of, of um, the South to live up to the law as articulated by the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Um, but nonetheless, uh, Martin Luther King espouses this idea of uh, of naturalism of, of, or has this naturalist approach to law where he claims that you have a moral duty to disobey unjust laws um, and a moral duty to obey just laws. Now we talked about ballot versus the bullet, the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment has become instrumental. Go ahead and pause the video as you see fit. We talked about major acts of Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, I'll include a video. Um, from Harvard Law School um, talking about the 
um, legacy of the Civil Rights Act, which does a lot of things like it bans um, racial segregation in um, uh, public accommodations. So like in hotels, um, for instance, um, it does, um, you know, it provides funding. So it gives some teeth. Um, there's some a little bit much more enforcement power to um, uh, that is given to the executive. Um, remember how we talked about the lack of enforcement that um, the Supreme Court has and, and how historically some decisions by the Supreme Court have gone ignored, um, although that would that would definitely be seen as a uh, unacceptable in today's society, it, 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 or at least I, I think it would. I don't know. Um, but we talked about some of the provisions of the Civil Rights Act, um, so you can see them here. Um, they also allocate additional funding for um, the executive branch to ensure that people um, uh, that schools desegregate. It also allows the federal government to withhold funding to uh, institutions that engage in racial discrimination. So it's huge expansion of expansion of federal government power and ensuring yeah. civil rights. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 is another provision that we talked about um, that kind of eliminates all these um, artificial barriers mm -hmm. to um, African Americans um, access to the vote and it dramatically increases um, their ability to access the vote. So look at this slide, pause it, the video. Went through mass incarceration. We talked about mass incarceration at length. And then this is just like you writing your essay. This is just the last bit that we didn't get to talk about a lot, but it was in your reading. Um, so we had, I had posted something on Instagram about the 19th Amendment. Uh, there's an interesting Vox article that I'll include in the description of this YouTube video that talks about the 19th Amendment. And um, it has kind of like a controversial, well, not a controversial take. The 19th Amendment didn't give a woman the right to vote. Um, obviously, the language of the 19th Amendment. Um, um, the right of the citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on an account of sex. Um, it's it's commonly understood to give a woman the right to vote, but the, in the Vox article, it chronicles um, persistent efforts after the passage of the 19th Amendment to deny um, African and women uh, the ability to cast their ballots. The Equal Rights Amendment uh, was proposed. There was a movement to include it in the uh, Constitution. It was rejected. Um, there's been kind of like a revitalization of the Equal Rights Amendment, and I'm going to include an article about that in the description. Then lastly, uh, this is going to be especially relevant. Um, there's going to be an interesting article in the description that I'm going to have on sexual assault in Title IX and like policies pursued in the Obama administration, but Title IX of the Education Amendments in 1972, no person in the United States shall on the basis of sex be excluded from participation and be denied of the benefits or, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. So I'll include all those in the description of this YouTube video. Now I wanted to switch onto a different topic and think more abstractly about why judicial opinions matter. We had talked at length about stare decisis, this principle that kind of, uh, of let the decision stand that is supposed to uh, provide stability in um, lawmaking. In our system, in our common law system, the Supreme Court, um, their decisions are not only binding on the parties of the case, they're binding on everyone. Um, so a Supreme Court decision becomes a law of the land. So for example, the Obergefell decision, which um, said that Obergefell was entitled to same-sex same marriage rights, um, not only applied to the to Obergefell, um, a plaintiff, but applied to the law of the land, right? So it effectively um, made unconstitutional any prohibitions on same-sex marriage. So you read The Roundhouse, which is an interesting piece of literature and AP literature. Um, which was very interesting. And in the Roundhouse, it was super, super fascinating to read the Roundhouse along with you guys. Um, basically, um, um, the character, let me think of his names. What's the character's name in the Roundhouse? Joe, right? Yeah, Joe. So Joe kills Lyndon Lark um, and um, Essentially in the roundhouse, just to recount it, Joe kills Lyndon Lark 
because there's all kinds of jurisdictional issues. So Lyndon Lark can't be brought before a court to be charged for raping Joe's mom. And so Joe kills Lyndon Lark um, and um, Joe's uh, father, who is a tribal justice, um, he wants to write an opinion um, and a site specific precedent, um, Musham's story about Wendigo justice um, to provide the legal basis by which um, Joe, um, um, you know, you know, killed Lyndon Lark. Um, so essentially, what is stare decisis? And it also gets us thinking about, um, you know, oppression generally, right? And so there's no doubt in my mind that stare decisis is an interesting doctrine, but it, it's interesting what can, what is included, right? In, in, uh, or it invites us to think critically about our judicial system, right? Does oral tradition count as precedent? Um, 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 it also invites us to think about how precarious our system is, right? Because we had already previously discussed about how precedent um, and case law and, and, and stare decisis itself, um, it's kind of like this faux sense of stability because um, precedent is sometimes overturned in the words of Antonin Scalia. Okay, that's it for now. I'll include all kinds of links in the description of this YouTube video. Have a good day.